as they will say Saturday at the Belmont racetrack in New York City or outside of New York, I should say. Um, they're on the track. <laughs> Somehow there had to be something that would have been similar to uh, starting our meeting and starting that race. But nothing quippy came to my mind except the idea. So I apologize, okay? I made a mistake. Anyway, we'd like to call to order the uh, City Council, Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency regular meeting of Thursday, June 4th, 2015. Uh, we'll start with a flag salute. Richard, could you lead us in that? Thank you. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remember to turn off your cell phones. Roll call, please. Councilmember Kite? Here. Councilmember Townsend? Here. Council Member Smartrich? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wild? Here. And Mayor Hobart? Here. Okay, I don't see Robin Montgomery, but I understand Linda Norman Thomas is here. Ms. Thomas, would you come up and uh, tell us what we should know about the Pegasus Therapeutic Writing Academy? Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Linda Norman Thomas, <coughs> and I am from Pegasus. I've been a volunteer there for 12 years. Uh, Robin couldn't join us today, I'm sorry. Uh, she had a board meeting to attend. Uh -huh. uh, when, I'm here actually to thank you for the grant that you provided Pegasus Therapeutic Writing Academy for the 2014-2015 <coughs> season. We just ended the end of May. Uh, your grant you gave to us uh, provided three very important things. Provided water for our little riders <laughs> and for our volunteers. It also provided healthy snacks. And if I may approach, I have a thank you letter from Chase Burke. Um, she actually did a, a printout to thank each one of you individuals individually for doing so. And it's a printout with pictures of the children eating the snacks. May I? Sure. Pass these about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to tell you, you have no idea how happy the children are to come off out of the hot, dusty arena and get a cold bottle of water with their name on them. We actually write their names on each one so the kids get excited about that. And of course, they get to take them back on the school buses back to school and show them off. So that's always important. Um, I also want to thank you personally, because I am the volunteer coordinator of the charity. Uh, this is a paid position, um, even though I've been a volunteer for 12 years. But it is a vital position. Uh, other than money, Pegasus just needs horses <laughs> and volunteers to operate the, the, the stables that we have. And it's an ongoing process to find volunteers. Um, and I just want to thank you very much for, for partially paying the salary for me to do so. I'm an independent provider. And I just travel about the valley calling on different accounts and also at speaking engagements, finding additional volunteers. Um, and if I may, we have a 30-second public service announcement. Would you mind playing that, please? Everybody comes here with a bright smile and positive attitude. You know, you can show up here and be in the worst of mood and leave with the most grateful heart. If you're thinking about volunteering, I would definitely suggest coming down to Pegasus. Um, it's definitely an experience that uh, is, will last a lifetime. All we ask for is a couple hours of your time, whatever you can give. We just need your help. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for me? Any questions for Ms. Thomas? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank and you. Uh, 
Tell Robin that we wish her a happy birthday. Oh, I sure will, but we're not supposed to talk about her birthday. <laughs> whenever, whenever it arrives. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move next to a non-agenda public comment, an opportunity for people to speak on matters that are not on today's agenda. Uh, we have uh, two people who have filled out the slips who get priority. And uh, first is Alan Worthing. Okay. Well, thank you for having us, uh, <clears throat> Alan Worthy. Uh, so I was at last night's uh, Palm Springs City Council meeting, and dare I say, we're at least, uh, or at last, having the French Revolution over there, <laughs> Mayor Pounier and the City Council. Jenny Fode appears to be the only one that still doesn't get it. Um, I have been calling the Desert Sun for two and a half years with regard to the crime and corruption of the city, and they had refused to cover it. I spoke at length with James Meyer. Uh, he refused to cover it. And I have this letter that I've written, and uh, the Desert Sun to date refuses to uh, publish it. I think it's rather tame. It's just the facts. Uh, the title is Left in the Street. Following a pileup on the 10 freeway north of Cathedral City, I was left comatose for 12 days at a certain hospital in Rancho Mirage. When I returned home from a nursing home in Palm Springs, me and my family had been fleeced. With no help from the city of Palm Springs at Al, my, me and my three Scottish Terriers are now homeless. Please help cure the lien on my condo so that me, we may return home. P uh, Ruby, she wants to return home. We she know heard that. The word. <laughs> yeah, she's ready. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's more ready than I am some days. Uh, so that we, yeah, may return home. Yes, Ruby. P.O. Box 6051, La Quinta, 92248. Much gratitude, Thomas Allen Worthy. So one can only wonder why Mr. Greg Burton, uh, executive editor of the Desert Sun, does not live up to his own article that he ran on the front page of his paper. Editor, a Desert Sun newsroom for a new age. Well, everyone but me and a few other people I know of. Uh, Ruby? Uh, I don't know. It's odd, isn't it? Ruby. Um, he goes off on his little moral tirade, standards mean nothing unless we are ready to take a stand for them. Well, I'd like to know why the hell is he taking a stand for me and my family, and now that they finally bother to uncover the corruption over there that, as I've said here several times, affects all of you and all of us in Rancho Mirage and everywhere. I lived in this great city for seven to eight years, and we all know it started here. And when I first started showing up here, and I was not exactly clear-headed, quite fuzzy, really, uh, I had suggested to all of you to contact your counterparts over there. I don't think that was so far-fetched. And last night, Mr. Vendor or Binder, I, part, I beg your pardon, uh, my last comments last night in Palm Springs were, Mr. Reddy, I hope you're ready to deal with the crime, because if you're not, uh, we're going to have to be ready to replace you in November, right along with everyone else up there. Okay, the situation is dire, and the people over there in the city, thank God, have stood up. I'm glad the Desert Sun's in the mood half the time to cover it. We were fleeced by known people committing both civil and felon felonious crimes. And for the city attorney to sit back and to date, have no response. And I do have a current demand on the city. I mean, among other things, for the police brutality of preventing me from standing over there and having, you know, exercising my First Amendment right, which now the Desert Sun is violating. Three times that same cop did that, which is a federal offense. And the very idea that anybody over there on that council and that admin would tolerate it is inexcusable in this day and age, as though it is 1963 over there, when it was really no, 2013. To have a city where there's not one person, if it's not Mr. Reddy, then who is it that we can look to, look up to, and go to? 
The city, thank God, is in collapse, as it should be. But the absurd statement that Ms. Folk gave to the Desert Sun last week, she's just concerned about the momentum. And I nailed her on that. And last night, it was about, uh, oh, what was it? The Renaissance. See, they just can't stop congratulating themselves for their party mood and their party status. But as we all know, we cannot run the desert on party, or gala, and gay, because it ain't working, okay? No one should wind up in the street with a locked up home and a Mercedes Benz on the loose, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Worthy. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care of those dogs. Out of the impound to the four time. No wonder I throw. They didn't impound it four times. <clears throat> I demanded help from Doug Holland to bail them out, but at least I got that much. Great. Keep up the uh, <clears throat> good treatment. Yes, uh, Terry Guess. Hello. Uh, my name is Terry Guess. I live in the, the Colony Park on Gerald Ford Drive. <clears throat> I'm here to discuss the tree that have been planted behind the wall of my house by GHA Development and Vernon Lane Development. If you speak in the microphone, we oh. will hear you. I'm sorry. Start over? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. My name is Terry Guess. I'm a resident in the Colony Park on Gerald Ford Drive. I'm here to discuss the trees that have been planted behind the wall of my house by GHA Development in the Verlaine Project. <clears throat> Pardon me. I've included for you uh, the petition with the resident signatures and dimension photos to help you understand uh, this issue. The council is free to come to my house and observe the condition if you so desire. Um, the petition that you have explains my issues. And there's some photographs also included that have dimensions on them relating to the heights of everything back there. And um, you know, I, re I realize this isn't gonna be done in three minutes. It's something you're gonna need to review. Continue you know? to speak in the microphone. I said, I'm. I'm um, I realize this is something that you're going to need to review later. It's not going to be done now, you know. So, but uh, the the cover sheet is the petition that I drafted and had the residents along the wall sign, and uh, it explains all the issues that I have concerns with back there. Now, I have had a meeting with Mr. Gonzalez, the uh, developer, and he told me he was going to uh, call his partner out, his real estate marketing person, to discuss the. Uh, the heights of it and come to a resolution of an established height that he would include with the sales documents of the house when he sells it. I don't know, you know, that these trees are to be maintained at a certain height. We, he has not gotten back to me on that. So um, here I am <laughs> with, you know, with you to re review this. And well, I think we, uh, we can understand what you're talking about. It has eliminated my entire view of the mountains. There's trees that are eight, seven feet above the wall, as per the photographs that I've included there. All this stuff's falling on my patios. And I, I feel it's probably uh, devalued my property because it looks like I'm living right behind a national forest. And they're only going to grow higher. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing it to our attention. and. Uh... We will look into it. Okay. Thanks for allowing me the opportunity to present this. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak on a matter that's not on today's agenda? Seeing no one, we'll close that portion and we'll go to council uh, board member comments. Uh, does anybody uh, like to uh, have anything to say? Dana, I have a couple of comments. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I'd just like to um, recognize or uh, mention the group that uh, performed or uh, actually went out and collected money for the Relay for Life this last weekend at uh, Rancho Mirage High School. Uh, several weeks ago, the council voted to support this event and the team, Rancho Mirage, turned out over the weekend and uh, totally raised uh, between our contribution and between what they were able to get from donors about $7,000. <clears> so it was a very uh, big success. Uh, 
Sandra Johnson was actually the team captain. She recruited everybody, and it was for four hours between um, 6 o'clock uh, that evening and 10 o'clock that evening. It's the first one that they've had at Ranch Mirage High School, but we look forward to the next year uh, when it should be bigger and better, and I think they're planning on holding it outside. So that was for the American Cancer Society, and it was a great event. The other thing I just wanted to mention to everybody is a couple of months ago, we had the Ranch Mirage tennis team here, and I noticed in the uh, paper recently that uh, in their first season on varsity tennis, Ranch Mirage finished 12-2 and two as a team and won the De Anza League title, both in the team title, singles, and doubles. So uh, congratulations to Ranch Mirage High School in their first year winning the team title. Uh, it's really something, and next year they'll be in there with seniors actually playing. So congratulations, Rancho Mirage, and go Rattlers. Iris. Thank you. I have a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, one, one of them, uh, the first one is from our library director, David Bryant, and he wanted everyone to know that the Rancho Mirage Public Library will have their solar summer this year, and it will begin on Monday, June 8th. Uh, we are very excited because the library's solar energy project will add shades, shade structures with solar panels covering 50% of the library's parking. And this project is to save the city about $50,000 per year in energy costs. Quite impressive. So we want our patrons to know that during construction, which is going to be from June through Labor Day, there will be some disruption to regular parking, hopefully not too much, but as a convenience to its many daily visitors, uh, we want to remind our residents that the library has an additional parking area of graded soil at the west end of the property, and this area will be unaffected by this project. All other library services are unaffected by this very positive step to save energy, and this will no doubt add comfort through shaded areas, and we congratulate David and the library and the city for being able to uh, make this happen. So thank you all so much, and don't forget to visit the library and visit their website for all the events taking place all summer long. Thank you. And the next thing I wanted to report on, and I think Josh has some photos that we're going to be showing everyone, is our very exciting park project, our Rancho Mirage Community Park. I was over there last week and took some photos so everyone could see the progress that we are making. This is a view of the amphitheater from the uh, east going toward the west, and you can see the overhang and how impressive that is. Uh, next one, please. And this is Dusty, a right-hand man who knows everything about everything, and he's standing in front of the wall, which shows a lot of the textures that are going to be used in this project. And the wall he's standing in front of has a few holes in it, and he's pointing to where they do some core testing. So he tests for all kinds of things, and that's uh, a vital and crucial part of the construction. And Dusty is, is just an amazing guy to work with. Okay. And this is when you're standing in, and on this, what will be the stage, this is going to be uh, stage uh, left, and it's going to be a holding area, and performers will be there with a little bit of storage area in the back. And then on the other side is stage right, and that will be uh, for additional storage area and performers. And when you go to the next one, this gives you a little bit of an overview, and it'll show you what kind of structure the uh, rooftop is going to have. It's, it's very modern, it's very contemporary, and it's going to be very effective with uh, whatever sound is needed, and uh, will add a great deal of ambiance to the event. And there's Dusty again, and this is in back of the structure itself, and this is going to be an area probably used for a lot of receptions. And it's in the green room area. There's also restrooms back there and little holding areas for more storage. 
and uh, receptions are going to be a beautiful part of that whole park experience. And this is one of the restroom areas that will be back there. This is the other side of the reception area. So things are moving along very quickly and very beautifully. And this is the front view, so you can really get the full effect of it. We're standing up on a little bit of a hillside there where the seating will be uh, terraced. So down in front there will be chairs, and as you get further back, people will be, be able to bring their own chairs, their own uh, picnic areas, seating places, and uh, really set up a nice area for their own picnics and evening of entertainment. And Dusty again, and he's looking toward the um, little cottage we have over there, the Stone House, which is very uh, uh, one of our great um, treasures of our park area. And Dusty again, showing one of our pieces of equipment. There are a number of uh, exercise areas. They all consist of a, a variety of different modes of exercise. He's holding up the bars where you can have some adjustable weights and adjust the weight according to what your strength might be. And we have a little bit of concrete area so you know if you've got good footing. And then moving on to another one, here is Randy Viegas. And he was with us that day. He's showing one of the weights that makes it adjustable. So if you very, feel very strong that day and you've built up some good muscle tone, you can adjust the weight accordingly. And uh, if you don't want quite so much weight, you just move it around. And here is Randy again showing us his real strength. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, showing everybody in, in the, the uh, who came with us. I think there's one last one uh, that we kind of skipped over, and that shows us that this is the end of the presentation. These are the, the Randy, Dusty, and my husband, Tom. And uh, as you can see, nobody has ever accused my husband of being a real fashion plate, and that day it turned out that he put the vest on upside down. So we... <laughs> He, he thought it was the right way, but now we know for sure he's not a fashion plate. <laughs> but uh, we thought it was a, a cute ending to this presentation. That brings everyone kind of up to date a little bit about the progress that's, uh, that's being made at our, live, at our uh, park. And we're so proud of things that are happening and can't wait till it's open and we can all enjoy all the activities. Thank you. And thank you, Randy. All right. Thank you, Iris. Uh, anything, uh, Charlie? Ted? Uh, I'll mention briefly, last Saturday at Mission Hills, there was a water summit uh, where uh, CBWD, uh, the city, Sunnylands, uh, various entities uh, were there to speak about the situation. This morning, we had a, sustain a sustainability meeting, and we're going to be putting out in the course of the next several weeks, uh, information to all of our residents. And we'll answer a lot of the questions that are, uh, frankly, called into our uh, planning department, uh, Jeremy Lime, on a regular basis. And they're questions like, what is the rebate incentives? And are they available to me? Uh, how can I initiate the process? When is the rebate money distributed? Uh, things that uh, CVWD is instituting. Uh, questions about how much I'm required to conserve based upon the state's mandate. Uh, what will happen if I allow my grass to turn brown? Uh, I, I notice a water waste in my neighborhood. What do I do? Who do I call? So those are the kinds of questions that are directed to the city. We are going to put all of that in a condensed letter, and that will be going out to everyone, and I think that that will be of immense help. And I will say this, that the water summit at Mission Hills last Saturday was extremely well received. And should other communities desire to have the same kind of summit, uh, the city will make uh, our resources available. Uh, last week, um, 
uh, in addition to uh, myself, uh, we had a representative of code enforcement. Uh, Pamela Berkey was there, who uh, monitors uh, any waste in the various communities. Uh, planning was there. So we're available to speak to any of the communities that need help and need answers. Uh, don't hesitate to call us. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. We'll move on now to uh, the minutes of the May 21 meeting. Is there a mo motion, please, to approve those minutes? So moved. I'll second it. Please vote. The motion carries unanimously. We move now to the consent calendar. Randy, what's this about? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Consent calendar consists of item number one, which are three resolutions and a direction to the City Clerk for the uh, annual levy, levy of the special taxes and assessment for fire protection and prevention and community facility districts number one and two. Uh, these have been in existence in the city of Ranch Mirage for several decades and uh, represents a significant portion of the city's operating uh, annual operating revenue. So three resolutions and a direction to the council uh, to the uh, city clerk on page 1-1. Item number 2 on your consent calendar is a request for the housing authority board to receive and approve the fiscal year 2015-2016 rent levels for our affordable housing projects, which consist of Parkview Villas, San Jacinto Villas, Santa Rosa Villas, and Whispering Waters. So those action items are on page 2-1, 2-5, 2-10, and 2-13, but you can just simply make the recommendation of approval on 2-1, and that will cover all of the uh, four projects I mentioned. Item number three on your consent calendar is a request that the Housing Authority Board approve the uh, revised rules and regulations for the affordable housing projects I just mentioned. All of the revisions are minor in nature and they're highlighted on pages one and two of your staff report. And Sean Smith, our housing manager, can go into details upon request, but they are all minor for this year. Item number four on your consent calendar are demands. And uh, are, is there any question or any request to pull any? Seeing none, any member of the audience like to discuss uh, any of these uh, consent item issues? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent uh, agenda, please. I'll second it. Moved in, seconded. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. We'll move now to discussion items uh, with respect to the Rancho Mirage Energy Leader part, uh, Partnership Status Report. Have there been any requests, uh, uh, Ms. Clerk, uh, to speak on that matter? No. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to address that subject? Seeing none, uh, we'll close the public session. And Britt, uh, where are you? You're down here. Would you please uh, give us your uh, thoughts on this? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council. The uh, Rancho Mirage is a member of the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, and one of its committees is called the Environmental or Energy and Environmental Resources Committee. Uh, that committee is charged with um, implementing something called the Desert Cities Energy Partnership, which is a joint utility-funded program that includes utility partners, Southern California Edison, and the Southern California Gas Company. Uh, DCEP, as, as we call the Desert Cities Energy Partnership, it's a regional energy partnership program, involves the member jurisdictions, these utility companies, and various other partners. And its purpose is to help local governments lead their communities uh, in increasing energy efficiency. Uh, within that DCEP program, there's something called the Energy Leader Partnership Program that was created. Through this, SCE and uh, Southern California Gas Company, they provide support to the local governments to help identify and address energy efficiency opportunities in our municipal facilities, help us to take actions to reach California's long-term 
energy efficiency strategic plan and increase community awareness about energy conservation. Um, a key goal in the local government partnerships is helping the cities and counties lead by example. So we, you know, we want to put ourselves up as a role model for our residents and the community in general about energy conservation. Uh, and that's one of the purposes of having this on this agenda tonight so that word gets out to the, to the audience. Cities participating in the Energy Leader Partnership, they have to achieve certain milestones uh, and criteria which will allow them to uh, be rated as valued silver, gold, or platinum level. We are currently at the silver level and the, this presentation to the City Council and our community will allow us to bump up to the gold level. And um, these are not just uh, necessarily feel good uh, levels, but we actually get increased incentive rebates. So as we do more energy projects, we get more and more money, as pointed out in the staff report. Um, just a very quick reading of some of the programs that we have done, again, so, because we're trying to activate the community to understand some things. Uh, we've participated in uh, doing a lot of energy conservation projects. We were awarded in 2014 the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Energy Star Award. We were the first city in the valley to, to be uh, awarded that. We have participated in numerous Southern California Edison energy conservation programs, including the demand bidding program, direct install, customized solutions, and express solutions. And that's helped us to um, change light bulbs at City Hall, uh, put in power strips, motion activated power strips, and the like. Uh, also, Southern California Edison, as part of this Energy Leader Partnership, they introduced us to the Energy Coalition. Uh, when we were sort of, we thought we'd hit all the low hanging fruit on energy conservation, how could we conserve more? We, along came the Energy Coalition. It is funded by the state's Public Utility Commission, and we've had a very good relationship with them and with uh, SCE helping us uh, do that work. So as you are aware, we're currently working on replacing street lots, lights, replacing boilers at City Hall, and pool pumps at the various housing authority properties. Um, with that, we've, uh, we've also joined the, uh, as part of the Energy Leader Partnership, the Climate Registry. That's a nonprofit group that helps governments with their greenhouse gas reduction mandates. We are mandated by the state of California to reduce our greenhouse gas. Uh, that program is uh, overseen by our planning department. So we c hope to continue to monitor and assess our various energy conservation projects in the city. We're always looking for ways to improve and, and uh, get that extra uh, kilowatt hour saved. Uh, so we will continue to do that with the council's, uh, obviously, policy direction. We do have Nina McCullough from Southern California Edison is here in the audience should you have any questions of her. So with that, I will uh, turn it back and just encourage everybody listening to save energy. Thank you very much, uh, Britt. Does anybody have any questions of Britt? Okay, fine. Thank you. We'll move on to item number six, the CV Link update. Do we have any requests to speak on that, uh, uh, Cindy? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on the subject of the CV Link? Seeing none, we'll close the public session. Uh, I do have some comments I'd like to uh, make uh, concerning the CV Link. I want to report that we had a meeting of the executive committee on June 1, 2015, just a few days ago. The um, executive committee means the uh, one member from each city or jurisdiction uh, that belongs to CVAG uh, can send a member of the executive committee. Usually it's the mayor, uh, the city, uh, the uh, supervisor, uh, and, uh, but any uh, alternative. Uh, we had a uh, full house and a full house and then some at the meeting on June 1st. The city of Rancho Mirage had uh, produced uh, four motions for consideration by the executive committee, uh, one of which uh, the uh, motion that we had made was to hire an independent attorney to evaluate whether Measure A funds could be used to pay for operations and maintenance of the CV link over the coming decades of following its having been completed, assuming that it gets completed. And um, the reason that we withdrew the motion was because uh, at that meeting, the um, uh, CV link leadership uh, said that they would release a document that they had previously claimed 
to be attorney-client privilege, that they would release a uh, report from the law firm of Best Best and Krieger, uh, a well-known firm uh, throughout Southern California, uh, <clears throat> with respect to their opinion as to whether major A funds could be used for uh, operations and maintenance, also referred to as O&M, uh, in, in the future. Uh, I, being the member uh, of the executive committee, I withdrew the motion uh, because it seemed improper to assume that we would need an independent uh, voice answering the legal questions uh, until at least I had read what Best Best and Krieger uh, had to say on the subject. And uh, now that I have seen it, uh, comprehensive in many respects, uh, my feeling is that we still need uh, an independent outsider that has no ax to grind uh, make an assessment of the legality of using major A funds. Best Best and Krieger has been the counsel for CVAG for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And um, so it did not seem to be uh, it certainly wasn't surprising that it took the position that there is a, to use their words, there is a strong argument to be made that Major A funds could be used to pay for the operations uh, or the maintenance, that is, of the CV link with respect to a limited portion of the CV link, and that portion being the low speed electric vehicles that will be permitted. Uh, on the pathway uh, when and if it's completed. So uh, it was the best, best in Krieger opinion that Major A funds could be used to support that element of the roadway uh, that was related only to these low speed electric vehicles, meaning golf carts and other similar vehicles that cannot exceed 30 miles per hour. Major A funds, if there's anybody who doesn't know exactly what that is, Major A funds is a fund of money that was approved by the voters of Riverside County in 2002 to approve a one-half cent sales tax increase with those funds being dispersed throughout the county. Coachella Valley gets uh, Fifty percent of our share, the, the eastern share, uh, for Measure A funds. at sales tax money that voters approved uh, in 2002. The issue is some cities, so far Rancho Mirage included and Indian Wells included, Coachella included, and I think Desert Hot Springs included, some cities think that it would be improper to use Major A funds to, to pay for the idea of the CV link uh, when there are so many roads and highways and bridges that are in serious need of repair and modernization. So should the question will boil down to if it's legal, should we take money from that fund to pay for the ongoing maintenance of the low-speed electric vehicle section of the CV link. Uh, that's an issue that uh, currently is uh, being fought hot and heavy within uh, the various cities. With respect to routes, the um, executive committee approved a staff request that they consider, for environmental impact purposes and others, other purposes thereafter, whether or not uh, they should run the CV link from Cathedral City to Monterey Avenue, that is, from Cathedral City to Palm Desert, along, straight along Gerald Ford Boulevard or Avenue. What is Gerald Ford? Drive. Drive. And um, that motion uh, carried for them to make that evaluation. Uh, an interesting side on that was the mayor of Cathedral City 
asked me uh, why I would suggest Gerald Ford as a possible route uh, when he lives on it. Didn't I have any concern for his residence? I pointed out to him that uh, Rancho Mirage did not make that recommendation. Rancho Mirage actually opposed that recommendation, that the recommendation was made by the leadership of CVAG, leadership of CV Link. So everybody now has that uh, um, pretty much correct in their minds. Uh, one of the other proposals was that the, the uh, CV Link people go back and re examine uh, the environmental impact of uh, running the link down the Butler Abrams Trail once again. We have already prohibited it by action of this council, but there was a motion uh, to reconsider uh, whether or not uh, if they took elect the electric vehicles off of Butler Road, I mean Butler Abrams Trail, uh, would that be satisfactory? Butler Abrams Trail people uh, could not have been more emphatic in saying that would not work for them. And I could say that uh, anybody that wants to despoil that little section of, of our trail, trailways in our city um, is going to have to climb over a lot of bodies before they get to it. Uh, as I mentioned, Desert Hot Springs uh, and Coachella support us. Indian Wells was a strong supporter. Indian Wells has now come out uh, and taken the position that uh, uh, they're going to put to the voters the question of whether or not Measure A funds should be used uh, for anything having to do with the CV link. They're going to put to the voters whether the uh, route that is proposed to go through uh, Indian Wells, which is one of two at the moment, they're now moving toward a third. One is uh, Highway 111. The Indian Wells Council have said that'll never happen, just like the Rancho Mirage Council voted to prevent that. The other route through Indian Wells that is being proposed is through um, along Fred Waring. They said no way to that, and not in a formal vote, but in an informal discussion. And uh, the third way that uh, CVAG uh, proposes for the uh, CV link to go through the uh, golf course along the, the White Warner Channel. Uh, and uh, the representative uh, Mayor Peabody uh, from uh, Indian Wells uh, felt confident in suggesting that uh, their voters would never approve any of those, those routes. One of, the, one of the other things that occurred at the meeting was all, a lot of members of the public had the opportunity to speak on it. And um, an interesting uh, breakdown, there were some people from the health uh, fields that spoke about, uh, in glowing terms, about how the um, health benefits would be improved if we had the CV link. Uh, there is an organization that was created by the CV link called the Friends of CV link. Uh, which is a uh, group of bicycle riders who meet and uh, uh, enjoy riding their bicycles like anybody who rides a bike does. Uh, a good number of them spoke. Uh, most spoke uh, staying pretty much on the issues. Uh, some leveled uh, uh, rude uh, remarks toward me and our city. But the one thing I observed that none of either of those categories of speakers, and that must have taken at least a dozen to 15 people, if not more, not one single one of those supporters of the CV link mentioned who was going to pay for it. That was left to a handful of us who believed then and continue to believe that it is a significant and serious issue concerning the operations and maintenance of the uh, uh, CV link once it is finished. In that regard, it should be noted that much of the discussion, they, the CV link people had brought in some, somebody associated with one of the Riverside uh, County uh, trails and a couple of other trails 
uh, none of which had any uh, similarity to uh, the proposed CV Link Trail. And they had them talk about the cost of maintaining these totally dissimilar uh, entities. And uh, the purpose for that discussion is uh, somewhat cloudy, but in my opinion, and I stress it is an opinion, it has to do with a switch of tactics that we will see coming soon from the CV Link people. In August of 2014, the CV Link leadership with the, CV, with the CVAG staff helping, prepared a draft master plan. That draft master plan cited first year operations and maintenance expenses. First full year, once the whole 48.2 miles or 50, you hear different numbers, once the mileage had been uh, completed, they estimated in that draft master plan in August of 2014 that the cost of keeping the maintenance and the operations working would be $1,619,900, round it to $1.6 million. Rancho Mirage took that number, the 1.6, if you just divided it by the nine city council members uh, and the county, uh, say 10, 10 entities paying, if they paid equally, that would be what, uh, $160,000 in the first year uh, for each of us. Correct me, by the way, Mr. Finance Director, if I do any number incorrectly because somebody will charge me with doing it intentionally incorrectly, and uh, I don't want any charge like that to have merit, because accuracy is the one thing that we've attempted to emphasize in this, and transparency is the other. At any rate, the 1.616 uh, number was challenged by us uh, suggesting maybe, maybe, not anything more than that, maybe it wasn't high enough, maybe it should be higher. But that gave them the opportunity to re-examine it, and they're, on the, they're in the way now, uh, oh, I should say, uh, they're in the way now to coming off that number. But I mentioned the March, the uh, August uh, draft master plan, having that number. That was August of 2014. In March, of 2015, you know, two months ago, barely, uh, two months ago, the number for projected uh, operations and maintenance in the first year was again $1,616,900. Again, 1 $1.6 million. So just as of two months ago, that's what their professionals told us uh, was a reasonable projected figure for the operations and maintenance of the program. They are now taking the position that that which was to be the final master plan uh, was requested to be modified by us, Rancho Mirage, so that they don't have to say they decided to change it on their own. Rancho Mirage has made no request that they do anything to the master plan. It's utter nonsense. And we made that comment, said it to them face to face at the meeting on June 1st. We've made no request that they modify anything in the master plan. We don't have enough information. We don't have enough expertise to suggest modification. So we've taken them at their number, 1.6 million, and then what we've done is projected various ways as to how much that would cost each city or, in some respects, only Rancho Mirage. One of those other respects is the the official recommended proposal by uh, CVAG and the CV Link people 
as of April 6th, uh, for, at the Transportation Commi Committee meeting, that is the CVAG Transportation Committee, they recommended approval of this master plan that I've talked about, the one for March of this year. Had we not been upset by the numbers that were being given to us by Tom Kirk, who came to City Hall, spoke to a subcommittee of uh, Richard Kite, I believe, and I, and uh, it's compro comprised of Randy, and there was one other person from staff present. He told us the TOT uh, proposal that they were also recommending at the Transportation Committee meeting on April 6th of this year. And that projected out, without going into the numbers, that had five cities paying for like 95% of the entire cost of the operations and maintenance into the indefinite decades ahead. Five cities, Palm Springs, because five cities have enough TOT to make that figure uh, to make it pass, so to speak, if we all approved of it. Palm Springs making the most in TOT. Second is Palm Desert. Third is uh, Indian Wells. Fourth is Rancho Mirage. And fifth is La Quinta. Those five cities would have been paying about 95% uh, of the cost. The county would be paying virtually nothing. They don't have hotels. They have one, maybe it's a hotel or motel or so, but it provides very little in the way of TOT, transient occupancy or bed tax, TOT. So we rejected that plan. So if they turn out with another final master plan, and the figure is off of $1,616,900, which I have every reason to suspect will occur, uh, the problem that that creates is this. Those of us who are responsible to a city to say yay or nay as to the city assuming the long-term expenses of operations and maintenance of the CV link in the coming decades, we now have two numbers that we have to choose from. We have, it'll be slightly under a million probably on the new one or the 1.6. Well, we have to assume the 1.6 is the accurate number. It was the least politicized number. And, uh, and maybe we would want to have our own assessors look at the numbers to see if that 1.6 is adequate. But even though they come in with a lower number, people with the responsibility of putting their cities on the hook for paying that over the coming decades have got to examine extremely closely and with some degree of skepticism about any reduction that uh, CVAG may come up with for the next version of the master plan. The last point that I'd like to make and that I made at that meeting is this is a project. There, there's a legal expression. It's called ask backwards. Uh, what that means is it's like the cart is before the horse, so to speak. Uh, there are other ways of describing it, but that's the way lawyers describe it. The, uh, have you ever heard of a $100 million project? And we've got some people in this audience right now who we'll be seeing and hearing from shortly uh, who know how to deal with projects in that, those kind of numbers. Can you imagine a project of $100 million that if it goes bust, not one person will lose a dime? Nobody has skin in the game. The $100, the $100 million is being raised by grants from governmental entities, from hospitals, or from uh, park uh, sources. 20, 20 million of it, they, they claim that they've raised, they claim they've raised about 75 million. They've really only raised 55 million. 
an additional 20 million of it is what they assume they're going to be able to get out of uh, Measure A funds. That still has to be decided. So they claim they raised 75. They've actually raised 55. They're expecting to take up 20 million more of Measure A funds. So if the whole thing just simply falls apart at the end after the money is spent and the 50 miles of Linkway is put together and no city is willing to sign on to assume the responsibility of operations and maintenance, at these figures, it's $33,000 a mile in the first year. If you figure, say, 2% increases for cost of living adjustments for the long-term future, that number, the 1.6 million, es escalates fairly rapidly. So if the cities decided that they couldn't pay it, who loses money? Amazing, nobody. It's just money that not one person loses because nobody has financial responsibility for the success. And in this case, they have absolutely no plan, no current plan, for how they're going to pay that $1.6 million per year, escalating at 2% over the next coming decades. They have no idea. And I dare say there was never been a hotel built that didn't figure out O&M based on room occupancy, percentage of room occupancy, and other factors. So they would know how much they're going to have to keep feeding into the project until it finally gets its wings and goes sailing. This project is the most unique thing I've ever heard of in that context. Nobody has skin in the game. Nobody loses if it goes broke. What a way, what a magical way to do business. At any rate, that's the end of my report. Just wanting to bring you up to date where we are. And um, hopefully the right things will happen and we'll determine along the way what those are. But the city of Rancho Mirage certainly is not going to sign on to any route going through the city until we know what the costs are going to be or until we have absolute certainty that we're indemnified in some manner uh, by some organization, some private organization, some public organization. We don't care. But we're not going to uh, put that kind of a burden on future residents of Rancho Mirage. Okay. Any other comments? From yes, Council? Mr. Mayor. Um, and maybe I didn't hear you uh, mention about the meeting that will be held now, which was reluctantly yeah. approved. Um, and as I say, reluctantly approved because it was suggested several six, times six in the four. past. Six to four. Yeah. It, when I say reluctantly, it was a six, 60, six to four vote. But the irony in the vote was that some people didn't want to have a collective audience of participants, of council members, finance directors, city managers, all in one room, hearing what each city had to say about this issue. And when you hear that, it's like there's a fear that maybe something negative will come out of it. Um, Fortunately, it was approved by, I like to feel, uh, cooler heads, and that meeting will now take place, and I think there'll be some awfully good things that come out of it. And one other point also, uh, when the mayor mentioned the various examples of trails uh, that they showed as an indication, the question was asked, how many of those trails have electric vehicles on them, as opposed to what originally had been proposed as a bike and jogging trail? And the answer was none. So obviously the examples were not very, very good. So with that, and I think with the mayor's presentation, uh, we've got a long way to go and an awful lot of uh, 
blanks to fill in. Thanks. Dana, just a brief comment. Um, the, uh, the turnout, as the mayor has said, was wall-to-wall uh, -wall at the meeting. More importantly, there were five from Rancho Mirage. And it's the first time that I've been to a CVAG meeting where a full council turned up on, uh, to discuss a matter. So I think we were really there showing the rest of the public how serious we were about the future of this program as it goes through Rancho Mirage. Not only the, the route, which may or may not be determined at some point in the future, but also the cost for maintaining uh, the, the whole program. So I think the people understand how Rancho Mirage uh, feels now about CV Link, and I think by us being there at the meeting the other night, uh, it really showed everybody we were serious about the future of this program. Yes, I would like to mention a couple of things because um, a few years back, um, some of you might remember, there was an agreement by, I believe, all nine cities in regard to um, funding uh, a homeless shelter, Roy's Homeless Shelter. And um, unfortunately, things came to pass and the funding kind of fell away. Uh, and as of this last year, uh, the funding that was supposed to be contributed by most or all of the cities was $103,000 per year. Um, unfortunately, in this last year, there's only three cities that actually paid the 103000 one of which is, of course, Rancho Mirage, who has been paying all along. Um, other reasons came into play, obviously, why some of the cities can discontinue playing, paying or chose to pay a lesser amount. But it really showed very quickly how just because someone agrees to something doesn't mean there's going to be a guarantee that it will happen. Um, another issue, and, and Dana talks about skin in the game, um, I think that's an example of, of how so many cities really didn't want to have this, their skin in the game. But besides that, when you talk about Measure A, uh, which is supposed to be taking care of streets and bridge projects, um, most people are not even aware that in this lineup of projects to be done by the entire Coachella Valley, there are 247 projects on the books, of which only 10 of them are supposed to be done in Rancho Mirage. Um, if this plan for the CV Link is agreed to, then of course the CV Link project will come to the very top of the list and all the other projects will fall down the list. Some will be probably discarded or not even thought about for the next many years. So it's something that uh, Measure A is supposed to take care of, but certainly if the CV Link project becomes a priority, it will take over a great deal of the funding. Thank you. One correction I wanted to make in what I said. I said that uh, uh, Best Best and Krieger had been the uh, attorneys for um, uh, CVAG. Actually, they're the attorneys for RCTC, the Riverside County Transportation uh, Commission. Uh, but it is that commission that controls the disbursement of Major A funds to CVAG and to the CVAG uh, similarity uh, on the western uh, Riverside County side. Um, the uh, one, one further note about uh, the point that uh, Ted made, uh, right now it looks like we will be able to put together a meeting of all of the cities together, which was one of our motions. And um, uh, it's kind of hard to know what was said in that meeting. It got a little bit uh, uh, convoluted at times, but we think that what's being distributed is the current uh, master plan and each city with their finance director and their uh, staff, their city managers and the rest, will look at it and try to formulate some idea as to uh, the accuracy uh, of the projection of 
future operations and maintenance expenses. And then once each city has had an opportunity to evaluate the raw data or the put together the assembled data, uh, then we will have a joint meeting that uh, all cities uh, are expected to attend and uh, talk it out. And we see if we're on the same page about operations and maintenance, because it's a critical issue. And until that issue is decided, nothing reasonably should be done. I mean, it sh we should wait. We, one of our motions was to slow down the progress of the CV link. They're moving forward on that full steam ahead. We're saying slow down until we can get an outside legal opinion uh, as to some of your assumptions, particularly with respect to Measure A. Our motion to slow down the expenditures and the advancement of the project was defeated six to four. So we tried, but we failed. And the monies continue to be spent. The ad, the television commercials we continue to see on TV all the time. Uh, new, per, new personnel are being hired. Uh, and all of that costs money that we might have to repay in all or in part. And it seems frugal to get some of these issues regarding operations and maintenance resolved before we incur much more in construction and design and preparation costs. So, Dana, one of the new events that came up Monday at the meeting was the possible involvement of Golden Voice uh, and coming in at that end. So that's kind of a wild card all of a sudden being thrown in by CVAG uh, which even confuses the matter more. Yeah, the reason I didn't mention Gold, Golden Voice is on the day we're having our hearing with our four motions on that same day in the afternoon, we get emailed around. There is a, a letter dated June 1 from uh, uh, Golden Voice saying they may be interested in taking, uh, taking charge of the uh, O&M expenses throughout the future. Uh, it's a long letter and has, has a lot of if, ands, and buts in it. Um, and as I said uh, to somebody, uh, I think it was a reporter at the newspaper, uh, we shouldn't get too giddy too soon about the uh, idea of a sugar daddy coming to the rescue uh, of, our, uh, uh, of our CV Link project. It'd be nice if something worked out. And one of the issues raised at the meeting was, should staff talk, continue talking with uh, golden voice. My answer to that question was yes, of course. Talk to anybody you can, because if we can find a solution to the uh, O&M expenses, great. Then Rancho Mirage can be uh, much more interested in this project than it currently is. Anyway, thank you for that uh, reminder, Richard. And now we'll move on to uh, public hearing, item number seven. And uh, Randy? Who's going to start our discussion on this exciting issue? It is an exciting issue, Mr. Mayor. Our associate planner, Josh Altop, has been processing this project and will give you a clear, concise, yet comprehensive oral report. Josh? Thank you, Mr. Binder, Honorable Mayor, Council. With this specific uh, request, there are four entitlements. There's an adoption, adopt a mitigated negative declaration. There's an amendment to the Highway 111 West Pacific Plan Land Use District 7 to allow residential units. Uh, number three is to construct a 125-room resort hotel and spa with 48 residential condominiums. And number four is to subdivide the subject property into two parcels. Uh, it's located on the west side of Highway 111 between Block Cancer Survivor Park and the signalized intersection of Highway 111 and Atrium Way. The existing land use is land use district number seven of the Highway 111 West Pacific Plan. Uh, surrounding land uses to the east is the Atrium Neighborhood Center. Uh, to the north is um, Block Cancer Survivor Park and vacant land. And then to the west and south is also vacant land. Uh, the environmental assessment, an initial study has been prepared resulting in the recommendation to adopt a mitigated negative declaration. Mitigation measures were recommended for air quality, biological, cultural, and geological resources. A notice of determination will be filed with Riverside County Clerk once a final determination has been made by the council. And a summary of the mitigation measure and staff responses to agency comments received is included as attachment number two of the staff report. The second entitlement, the specific plan amendment. 
because residential uses are not permitted in land use district seven, a specific plan amendment SPA is required in order to consider the proposed residences. Staff supports amending land use district seven using the following design parameters. A limited amount of residential may be considered as part of a preliminary development plan application so long as residential development and construction is concurrent with the commercial component and residential development is considered secondary to the primary commercial component and third, residential uses are situated at least 600 feet away from Highway 111. Uh, because the applica applicant is proposing a resort hotel as the primary use, the residential units can be classified as secondary for the purposes of the SPA. The residential component is approximately 670 feet away from Highway 111 and as defined will be a secondary land use. Uh, the project includes a 125 room resort hotel with a restaurant, meeting facilities, spa, fitness center, and 48 residential units. The total combined square footage is just over 247,000 square feet on 24 acres. The proposed structures are architecturally styled in a desert vernacular with a connection to nature through frame views of the intimately surrounding Santa Rosa mountain foothills and desert landscape. Meandering paths, reflecting pools, sculpture gardens, and desert appropriate landscaping all create a choreographed experience of the site. Boundaries are blurred between interior and exterior space through retractable walls, large overhangs, private courtyards, and outdoor terraces. This is the proposed site plan. There are going to be three vehicular access points located on Highway 111 that lead into the project. All entry roadways lead to the main building, which has been set back more than 220 feet from Highway 111 to allow for an enhanced arrival sequence and to accommodate surface parking behind a landscape berm. The main building is positioned on an angle, which is in alignment with the resort's central access. This creates a focused perspective of the main building and is the first structure that comes into view upon arrival at the site. Composed as a campus of individual buildings rather than a single structured resort, the guest rooms have been located according to unit type and function. For example, the center of the resort contains the standard bungalow guest rooms that are organically positioned to encourage pedestrian circulation and invoke the element of discovery. The spa, fitness, and cafe buildings are all located at a higher elevation than the standard guest room and become a focal point from within the resort. The boot camp units are conveniently located adjacent to the fitness buildings in order to take advantage of the resort's program to promote a healthy lifestyle through physical activity within a group environment. The villas are upscale guest units and are grouped into two unique areas that are offset from the center of the resort. There's one row along the north property line that faces an isolated area of the foothills, and a second grouping forms a congregation area centered around a lawn space and fire pits. Due to the underground drainage utility easements, the western end of the site has been reserved for walking trails and sculpture gardens at the highest elevation and exterior yoga platform overlooks the entire site. The pad sites for the condos are terraced in order to look over the project and valley floor beyond. The grade changes occur along the eastern side of the residential roadways in order to create a level common yard with the opposite condominiums. The majority of the site is either flat or sloped slightly away from the surrounding mountains. The lowest elevation for the site is at Highway 111. The highest point on site is located along the western property line at 344. The site remains relatively flat with very minimal incline in the first two thirds, increasing in elevation by only 20 to 25 feet. Over the western third, the property elevation increases an additional 65 feet. Uh, vehicular access to the property is provided at three locations. The first is a non-signalized -signal right in, right out. The second is a sweeping right turn pocket that begins at the project's midpoint. The third is the existing signalized intersection on Highway 111 at Atrium Way. Staff required an on-site parking analysis. Based upon the calculations in the report, a maximum parking demand of 222 parking spaces will occur. The project has provided a total of 250 parking spaces for the resort, exceeding the recommendations of the parking analysis by 28 spaces. In addition to the resort parking, the project provides 96 garage spaces and 24 guest parking spaces associated with the condos. 
The Thunderbird Resort and Spa is based on desert contemporary architecture that complements the natural surroundings through the use of desert appropriate materials, textures, and colors. The resort architecture is heavily influenced by its natural setting and emphasizes its relationship to the foothills through its low scale, view corridors, and interaction between the indoor-outdoor spaces. Envisioned as a campus of buildings within an exclusive enclave, the architecture responds to the arid desert climate through the use of large horizontal overhangs, sunshades, and deep recesses to protect from solar heat gains that can cause increased indoor temperatures. Boundaries are seamless between interior and exterior spaces to the use of retractable walls, private courtyards, and outdoor terraces that function as exterior rooms. The first structure encountered by guests visiting the site is the 29,000 square foot main building with Porto Cocher. It contains a restaurant, convention main room, meeting rooms, media room, and a boardroom. The massing of the main building is divided into three main volumes, the restaurant block, the two-story back of house block, and the convention block. The center volume contains the highest massing at 30 feet. Designed to complement the natural hues of the surrounding foothills, the main building is comprised of rammed earth walls, concrete, metal, and stucco that all evoke the surrounding palette of warm grays, subtle browns, golden tans, and rust colors. Deep roof projections shade the facades and convey a horizontal geometry within the site. Uh, the operational goal of the resort is, to, excuse me, <clears throat> is privacy, a 10 foot high, berm is being constructed along the project's Highway 111 frontage. The landscape berm will screen all buildings within the resort, even considering the additional grade change throughout the site. This line of sight exhibit depicts the main building, which is the tallest and closest of the resort buildings. The dash line represents a pedestrian's vantage point from the sidewalk along 111. So from this exhibit, you can basically see if we were traveling along 111, either eastbound or westbound, and look towards the resort, you wouldn't be able to see anything due to the landscape berm. A sweeping porta cochere structure greets guests upon arrival and acts as a signature statement to the entry of the main building. Interior spaces connect to the exterior through operable glass walls. The spa is designed as a cluster of buildings, locker rooms, treatment rooms with decks and outdoor lounges, situated around an internal courtyard that promotes tranquility and relaxation. The main entry is defined by two planar roofs that cantilever over the entry and direct views towards the internal courtyard. Clad in a natural stone, the entry building differentiates itself from the rest of the spa buildings that are more secluded for privacy. The locker rooms are clad in concrete panels and accommodate a plunge pool. Skylights project from the roof, evoking the ridges of the surrounding mountain foothills. Conversely, the treatment rooms along the north side of the courtyard open to the foothills beyond. The rooms are screened from views through the use of a vertical trellis system and are shaded, from, shaded by a horizontal sunscreen. The private decks associated with each treatment room has an unobstructed views of the surrounding mountains. Of the 65 bungalow guest rooms, there are three types which meet a variety of guest needs. The standard bungalow is a 500 square foot freestanding structure with large roof overhangs. A private cactus garden and outdoor seating area is enclosed by a textured concrete wall. The bedroom looks out onto the private garden through a floor to ceiling glass wall and the garden will be dramatically lit at night. The entry into each unit is at a lower ceiling height to create a cozy feeling of compression before one experiences the taller bedroom volume and dramatic views out into the garden. An articulated concrete masonry wall at the entry evokes mid-century modern architecture and adds a layer of texture to the facade. A soaking tub overlooks another exterior garden creating an emphasis on the personalized experience of the standard bungalow. There are 17 one-bedroom villas that are 850 square feet each. The design intent of the villas is to promote a connection to the exterior through sight lines and outdoor spaces. For example, the entry affords continuous views through the living space to an outdoor terrace and beyond. Entries are recessed to allow for roof overhangs to function as shade structures. The living space contains a small kitchenette, dining, entertainment, and lounge area, as well as a separate powder room. The villas are low in profile and resemble individual homes. The exterior materials are upgraded from the standard guest bedrooms to that of a natural and ashlar stone cladding. The roof overhangs are horizontally exaggerated with built-in sunshades that cast a pattern on the vertical surfaces. The condominium units are designed in the same character as the resort buildings, which is that of a desert contemporary architecture. The primary component are rammed earth walls, fixed and operable glass walls, and large roof overhangs. 10-foot wide exterior balconies and outdoor patios promote views of the surrounding foothills. 
The units are staggered to promote views between the condos and the end units are rotated out five degrees. All condos will contain a two car garage with a 20 foot long driveway. The landscape design is a collection of curated desert friendly gardens to facilitate the different design requirements of the Thunderbird Resort and Spa. The overall design creates a luxurious resort feel with a variety of textures and colors while acknowledging the site's microclimates from lower to higher elevation. The exotic forms of desert plants are featured throughout the site either as punctuation in focal gardens or used exclusively at the upper limits of the site where they visually blend with the natural surroundings. The tree selections emphasize the resort's distinct communities and articulate the primary circulation. The idea is to thoughtfully preserve the natural hillside and invite native water efficient landscaping into the site with choreographed plants and vegetation. Uh, the project includes a 25 foot high diamond cut date palms averaging every 20 feet along Highway 111 Parkway. As an under canopy to the date palms, Desert Museum Palo Verde are strategically planted. In addition, as I stated earlier, the project is proposing a 10 foot high landscape berm to screen the resort from Highway 111. Uh, this berm will provide a noise barrier, enhanced privacy, which are two of the primary goals of the resort. Uh, this is a bungalow landscaping. The bungalow zone will use Argentinian mesquites, willow acacia, and desert willows to provide a mature and immediate presence of large canopy trees to create shaded experiences throughout this zone. The remaining plants for this area include Texas wild olive, red yucca, Texas sage, and trailing indigo bush. Each bungalow has a private cactus and agave garden with its own unique planting selection of cacti. Different paving throughout. Materials include asphalt for the front parking field and emergency roads, flagstone in between the boot camp units, interlocking pavers for the condo driveways, tile mosaics for the spa, travertine around the pools, cemented stone at the main entry, and areas of integral colored concrete. Each paving style and material is unique and designed to provide a different experience within the resort depending upon your location. Uh, the photo simulations of the project site demonstrate the campus-like atmosphere of clustered buildings. Simulation 1 is looking in a northwest direction from the property to the east. Simulation 2 overlooks a spa building and a cluster of standard guest rooms. The third simulation is looking over the condo units in a northeast direction. And simulation 4 is looking east over the boot camp unit showing an abundance of open space. Uh, the Commercial Development Subcommittee requested a visual simulation of how the resort would appear from the Ritz-Carlton. The first simulation is from within the Ritz-Carlton main pool area, and as shown, the proposed resort is not visible. The second vantage point is on a peak above the Ritz-Carlton, only accessible by hikers. The Thunderbird site is clearly seen below, but no more than any other developed property in the valley. The third vantage point is from the rear of the homes on Grande View Circle within Murata. These are the closest homes to the resort. The resort is visible, however, due to the significant distance between the resort and the Murata homes, the visual impact of the resort is minimized and specific project details will be indiscernible. Uh, staff prepared a, a, a brief fiscal analysis on what this project would propose to the city and TOT. Uh, the Sun Thunderbird Resort and Spa will be required to comply with the City of Rancho Mirage transient occupancy tax of 10% based upon the room rates. The applicant has indicated that the actual room rates have not yet been determined. However, based upon some preliminary room rate numbers, the following table has been generated. In using statistics provided by the Rancho Mirage Marketing Division, staff assumed an occupancy rate of 80%. Staff also used an average room rate of 800 per night. Thus, a single room would provide $80 in TOT per night, multiply 80 by the 292 nights, which is 80% of the year, and then multiply that number by the 125 rooms. Do the math, it's approximately an estimate the city will receive $2.9 million in annual transient occupancy tax. Uh, the room rates will be finalized once the hotel operator is chosen and the resort opens for business. Uh, the applicant is requesting approval to subdivide the existing 24-acre property into two parcels. Parcel one will be for the residential units and will total just over five acres. Parcel number two is the balance of the project and accommodates the resort and spa totaling 18.36 acres. Um, I'm going to summarize uh, from the Planning Commission meeting. I'm just going to go through a handful of extra slides and exhibits, just something to look at. It's a really sharp project. I didn't get a chance to get everything in, so I'm going to summarize and you guys can take a look at some of the other uh, exhibits. Um, during the Planning Commission meeting, uh, during the public hearing, no one spoke in op opposition of the project. However, Mr. Art Gardner of SE Engineering represented the adjoining property owner to the east, Mr. Martin Dolomo. He had several comments which were responded to by staff. A full account of the dialogue between has been included in the staff report as attachment number one. 
Uh, after due consideration of the staff report, public testimony, and exhibits, the Planning Commission upheld staff's recommendation to recommend approval to the City Council. Um, in summary, the proposed project meets and exceeds the requirements of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code and the Highway 111 West Pacific Plan Design Guidelines. The Architectural Review Board fully endorsed the project site design, architecture of the buildings, and proposed landscaping. The project will have a minimal impact to the surrounding neighborhoods based upon the location of the site, the landscaping proposed, and the private non-public use of the project and recommended conditions of approval. Staff is recommending that the City Council approve all requested entitlements, and that will conclude my presentation. Josh, thank you very much for that uh, report. I'd like to say that um, uh, Richard and I have worked with staff on this project for somewhere approaching a year, I would say. And uh, Josh, I want to compliment you on, a, uh, on an excellent uh, uh, presentation and keeping us all informed and staying on top of this project. It's, it's an important project and a, a good uh, feather in your cap. <clears throat> Are there any questions of staff? If not, we'd like to ask the developers to come up and uh, just explain to us a little bit about what your plans are, what, uh, what your hopes are, and um, anything else that would be of relevance to the community of Rancho Mirage. Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon. I'm Richard Weintraub. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and fellow council people. Um, hopes and dreams. Well, as it relates to this project, uh, our goal is that if we are approved today, that we will, um, with a few caveats, uh, be able to move forward with our operator uh, that we're deep in negotiations with and move forward with a project that would start no sooner than late spring, early summer. And the reason it wouldn't be sooner is because uh, we would have to actually do our construction drawings and get those through the city, and those are quite complicated given uh, the ex expansiveness of this, this project. Um, the dream is to create the best spa, luxury spa hotel in, in California. Uh, my wife very much enjoys going to spa resorts, the Canyon Ranch, Calavie, Miraval, and others, and all of those are significantly lacking in some way. And what we've done here and designed with our operator and with our architectural firm, Gensler, uh, one of the most prominent architectural firms in the world, and we have Derek Sola here today for any questions you may have, is to try to address those concerns and create a project that still has the intimacy or the feeling of a small resort or a luxury boutique hotel like the Hotel Bel Air or the El Encanto in Santa Barbara, yet still the critical mass and the uh, availability to offer all the modalities that a lot of the spas that were designed and created 20, 30, 40 years ago have not caught up with or have functionally obsolete campuses and the inability to do that. So uh, as you may or may not know, uh, we live, my wife and I, my two kids live in Los Angeles, but Rancho Mirage is our second home. And uh, we live right down the street over at Thunderbird and hence the holding place name for the project. And uh, we love it here. And even coming down here today, it's been very cloudy and overcast and cold in Los Angeles. It's a real pleasure to see the sun and to come to a city that's so well managed and uh, can afford a telescope I see <laughs> coming up later, <laughs> which I know my son's gonna be really excited about once that, that goes in. Uh, so I'm available for any questions if I haven't answered what you were expecting of me. I do have a question. Is this going to be built out in one phase, two phases, three phases, and how long will it take? Okay, uh, the, the, there will not, this will not be a phased project because of the uh, difficulties and the, and the noise and the disturbance that would be created for existing guests that would be staying there. Uh, we've proposed 48 condominiums, uh, which is not a lot of condominiums from initial interest or people who have expressed interest in having something like this living down here and being tied to a six-star spa resort. Um, we anticipate that we'll end up with fewer than 40 condominiums because of people combining. That happened in a project I had in Los Angeles on the Wilshire Corridor, which started out as 110 units and ended up being 80 because of people combining units. 
so we don't anticipate phasing uh, in the project at all. As far as the build out time, we're looking at around 22 months from when we first break ground to when someone could spend their first night in the hotel. Um, we don't think that's overly ambitious because most of our construction is type five wood frame with some moments of steel, uh, which would mostly be in the spa and in the main building with the restaurant and the, and the banquet space. Um, we have good geology, good drainage. There's a lot of infrastructure that was already put on the site, uh, uh, which we're gonna take advantage of. We're not doing a lot of um, land uh, mass reconstruction. So we think that's a realistic time, time frame. Good. The um, condominiums, when somebody buys them, is it going to be linked to the resort, and can the person rent the condominiums out? Uh, that's a good question. That would, that would follow into our CCNRs. So I don't know the answer as to whether or not the uh, condominium owner could rent it out, as one would do at like the Pierre or the Sheridan Netherland or at Ritz-Carlton Four Seasons products. I do know that the person who does buy a condominium will have full access and use of the entire resort and spa, priority seating for dinner, priority uh, for their guests, and discounts for their guests who aren't necessarily staying in their condominium but would be a guest at the hotel. Uh, there's a resort in England called Clifton, uh, which has a few hotels tied to it, and they do a similar program that we're trying to model ourselves after. Do you have a price tag on the condominiums? We don't yet, yet. <laughs> we, but we, we think we'll break the, uh, the, we think we'll set a new market for the price of the condominiums. Yeah. And they'll be furnished or unfurnished? They will be, there will be some models, but I, I believe they'll be unfurnished. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Thank you. The average square footage on the condominiums will be what? It's around 2,400 square feet, 2,200 to 2,400 square feet. And those will be two and three story? Uh, they're simplexes and duplexes. So some will be two stories and a lot of them will be one story. <coughs> Most people today want one story who would be buying something like this. Well, yeah, well, it's a very exciting project. And, uh, and having been on the Planning Commission for six years and being on the council for three years, I've seen a lot of projects. Uh, being a developer, I can relate a lot to what you're going through, and of course, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful now. You'll go through some frustration until it's finished, but uh, once you get your operator uh, uh, on the dotted line, then you can obviously, the next major big hurdle, which we all face, is the financing. Yes. So uh, that's going to be the key, and, and I think everybody on this uh, uh, Dais uh, wishes you the best. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, if I may just indulge you for a quick 30 seconds, it's to thank um, Josh and Bud Cop for their very hard work. Uh, we work in a lot of cities in Southern California, and, and I'll say this, uh, maybe get in trouble for it, this is a city that is the, my most favorite place to work for its professionalism, its pragmatism, and its uh, transparency. So I want to thank uh, Bud and Josh, as well as the City Council and Planning Commission for working with us as, as well. We, we like to hear those uh, words, Mr. Weintraub, yes. because we do want to have a reputation of being a city that uh, is easy to work with. Yeah. It's an important uh, attribute from our perspective, and it's always nice to hear compliments of staff from you. Yeah, I think you. Uh, Ms. Montrich has a question. Yes, uh, not a question, just a comment, because I'm really excited about this whole project, and I'm thrilled <clears throat> that you chose to put it in Rancho Mirage. Um, I, and to have a, a project that focuses on fitness and education and reflection and relaxation and the tranquility that it brings is, is very exceptional. And the fact that your only mode of transportation inside the campus is going to be <clears throat> golf carts and walking and bicycles, Yes. Uh, I think it really says a great deal for the health issues. Uh, this is truly going to be a luxury project and really focusing on, on health and wellness and um, a, tr a retreat for the body and the soul. Oh. And uh, I, I, I'm so glad that uh, we're going to be hopefully seeing it in our city. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. I would like also to thank the um, Planning Commission. They've raised a lot of great issues. And uh, they voted unanimously on these issues, five to zero. 
Seems like everybody's in accord that this will be a great addition to the city of Rancho Mirage. And I'd now like to ask, uh, is there a motion for item number one? We're separating each one will be voted separately. Yes, I'd like to make that motion, uh, Mr. Mayor. We'll take turns. Each of the four of you can make one of the motions. Go ahead. Uh, number one. Okay, uh, I would like to. First page. Okay. It's on page 73. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that the City Council adopt the mitigated negative declaration based on enviro environmental <coughs> assessment case number EA 140001. Yeah. Right. Nine. That's nine. Or nine, I'm sorry. Okay, is there a second to the motion? Second. second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Charles, would you I make will. This? Number two, that the City Council approve ordinance number. Next in line. For specific plan amended case number S is in Sam, P is in Paul, A is in Apple, 14002, based upon the content, findings, and conditions in the staff report and. One thing I should do, one thing we should do first, one thing we should do first is we should give the audience an opportunity to speak. Uh, oh. Is there any? I'll sit down then. Is, is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak uh, to this subject? Seeing none, we'll close the audience participation time and um, this will continue with uh, the second motion. Did you get it fully stated? I did, did sir. Okay, is there a second to the second motion? So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. Um, please vote. That motion carries unanimously. Uh, Iris, would and you like to make the third one? Sure. It's and off. number three, that the City Council approve preliminary development <clears throat> plan case number PDP 14007 based upon the content findings and conditions in the staff report and? We'll leave the end off of it. Is there a second? So be it. Moved and seconded. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. And Richard? Thank you, Dana. I just want to make a, <clears throat> one brief comment and thank uh, staff for putting this program together. It really turned out to be one of the best I've ever seen. I want to thank the developers for being patient with us and working with us to, to make what we think is going to be the best project in the Valley. So I think everybody came through and look, everybody's looking forward to this project. Certainly it will be a six star if we have anything to do about it. So I will now make the last motion that says uh, City Council approve resolution number next in line for tentative parcel map 36885 based upon the content findings and conditions in the staff report. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Needless to say, we wish you Godspeed and all the best. In any way we can help you, we're here. I'd like to say that um, some comments in the Desert Sun saying that Rancho Mirage does not welcome or does not go out of its way to have new development and businesses in this city. Hello, there it is. Well, to be fair to the Desert Sun, I don't think the Desert Sun has made that comment, but they, they have been some, some people who have right. been quoted in the Desert Sun, which of course is the business of the newspaper to quote people. And uh, so as long as we make that distinction. Thank you. Uh, we have enough uh, uh, <laughs> discord between <laughs> us and them, and there's no point in inviting more. Oh, how can you say <laughs> that? <laughs> okay, well, we'll move on to the next item, which will be agenda item number eight. And I can see that Bruce Harry and uh, Bill Enos uh, are working on this one. Uh, I'll give the Bruce? report, Mayor. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, this is the time each year the City Council sets property owner assessments for the Landscaping Lighting Maintenance District number 87-01. 
At the City Council meeting on April 2nd, resolutions were adopted to approve the preliminary engineer's report for Landscaping Light and Maintenance District Number 87-01 for fiscal year 2015-2016, which identified property owner annual assessments for maintenance of the citywide landscape meeting islands and certain special landscape maintenance benefit zones located throughout the city, and declaring the city's intention to levy such property owner assessments at the public hearing today. In addition, a property owner protest hearing for annexation number one to the Landscaping Lighting Maintenance District 87-01 is part of today's proceedings. The annexation is a requirement of the development agreement for a new residential tract development known as Verlaine Estates. The annexation will include the residential lots being created by this development into, the new special, into a new special landscape maintenance benefit zone F, pursuant to the development agreement. The special landscape maintenance benefit zone F will consist of a maintenance consists of the maintenance of a retention basin, which also doubles as a neighborhood passive green belt. The city has agreed to maintain the landscaped area on behalf of the property owners in exchange for the property owners being assessed for the full cost of the maintenance, which equates to an annual property owner assessment of $849.16. If a majority protest vote is not submitted by the end of the public hearing today and the City Council adopts the required resolutions attached to the staff report, the annexation will be completed. The proposed annual assessments for the citywide landscape meeting islands and four existing landscape maintenance special benefit zones are identified in, table, in the table on page 8-3 of the staff report. To summarize the proposed assessments, the city ass citywide assessment will remain at $26.42 per year per property owner as it has for the past 17 years. And three of the four existing special benefit zones, being zones A, C, and D, will see a very slight assessment increase, while zone B will see a slight assessment reduction as a result of the recent removal of all the landscaping turf and installation of drought tolerant plant materials. Staff requests the mayor at this time open the public hearing for annexation number one and take any public testimony and ask the city clerk to present any ballots and written protest received by the city for annexation number one and then close the public hearing for the annexation number one. The city clerk will then declare the results of the property owner protest ballot proceeding and shall and should a majority protest property owner protest not exist it is requested that the City Council adopt the first resolution, 2015 next in order, identified in the staff report. The next order of business will be for the Mayor to open the public hearing to receive any public testimony regarding the proposed fiscal year 2015-2016 property owner assessments for Landscape and Lighting Maintenance District 87-01. At the conclusion of the public hearing and any deliberations by the City Council, staff requests that the City Council adopt the remaining four resolutions and direct the City Clerk to file the appropriate agency certified copies and any and all landscaping lighting maintenance district resolutions as may be required, together with accompanying exhibits, attachments, and reports. This concludes my staff report and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Are there any questions of Bruce by any member of the council? Seeing, seeing no questions, is there any uh, member of the audience who'd like to uh, speak to this subject? Seeing none, we'll close the public session. Um, Madam Clerk, have we had any written protests? We have not. We've had no written protests. Consequently, hmm? uh, we've actually consolidated both hearings. So we're doing both. Right. We're going to, instead of separating them, Bruce, we're yeah. going to consolidate both hearings with one motion. And uh, I would move that we adopt resolution number 2015, next in order, declaring the results of a property owner protest ballot proceeding for the Ranch Mirage Landscaping and Lighting, Lighting Maintenance Assessment District number 87-01, Zone F as in Fred, Annexation number one, and the levy and collection of annual assessment related thereto, commencing fiscal year 2015-2016, pursuant to attachment uh, A attached. And to also adopt resolution number 2015 next in order, approving the engineer's report 
and assessment diagram contained therein regarding annexation of territory designated as annexation number one to the Rancho Mirage Consolidated Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District number 87-01 zone F and Levy Levy and collection of annual assessments related thereto commencing with fiscal year 2015 slash 2016 per uh, attachment B and further that we adopt resolution number 2015 next in order ordering the annexation of territory to the Rancho Mirage Consolidated Landscaping and Lightning Maintenance Assessment District number 87-01 zone F designated as annexation number one and the levy and collection of annual assessments related thereto commencing with fiscal year 2015 slash 16 pursuant to attachment C1 and that we adopt resolution number 2015 next in order amending and approving the final engineer's annual levy report for the Rancho Mirage Consolidated Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District number 8701 for fiscal year 2015-16 per attachment D and that the council adopt resolution number 2015 next in order ordering the levy and collection of annual assessments for the Consolidated Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District number 87-01 for fiscal year 2015-2016 per attachment E. Is there a second to the motion? Could you Please? repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> what, what, what is it that Kevin Klein said in the movie uh, where, uh, Wanda, what was it? A fish named Wanda. A fish, fish named Wanda. He says, after all of the, something like that just transpired, he said, what was that middle part? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but rather than voting on the middle part, let's vote on all of it. Please vote. <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. I would now move that we direct the city clerk to file with the appropriate agencies certified copies of any and all of the above not any, all of the above resolutions as may be required together with accompanying exhibits, attachments, and reports. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Please vote. The motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item number nine. Bruce, that's yours as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. This item is for the Park Maintenance District Special Tax Levy for fiscal year 2015-2016. <clears throat> Just a little bit of background, in 1998, the Rancho Mirage voters approved a special tax to maintain the city's public parks. As part of the voter-approved special property tax assessment, the city was authorized to adjust the annual special property tax assessment for annual inflation in maintenance, for maintenance expenses. On table 9-3 of the staff report, identify the proposed annual property tax assessment for fiscal year 2015-2016 and for comparison the past five years assessments. Since its inception since 1998 or in 1998, the special tax started out at $18.96 per year per parcel and is being proposed to be set for fiscal year 2015-2016 at a rate of $28.94 per parcel. This equates to an average annual increase of 59 cents per year since inception. Staff recommends the City Council adopt the resolution identified in the staff report and direct the City Clerk to file the appropriate agency certified copies of the resolution as may be required together with accompanying exhibits, attachments, and reports. This concludes my staff report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Any questions of Bruce by Council? Seeing none, any member of the audience have any questions or would like to speak to the matter? Seeing none. Uh, would one person like to make the motion and include both A and B to it in one motion? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 2015, next in order, ordering the levy and collection of the park maintenance special tax pursuant to ordinance number 685 for fiscal year 2015-2016 and direct the city clerk to file with appropriate agencies certified copies of the above re resolution as may be required, together with accompanying exhibits, attachments, and reports. Is there a second? Second. Please vote.
Motion carries unanimously. We move now to item number 10, Randy Villegas. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and uh, City Council members. The item before you today is the, uh, we're requesting an authorization to purchase the observatory dome and the telescope for the library observatory project. A Little bit of background on the project. It was approved to go to design and construction back on September 23rd of 2014. Our budget is just a little over $1.7 million. <clears throat> At this point, we are in design. We, uh, we are, the architect is preparing design plans to submit to the ARB. Um, and then shortly after that, we'll be going to plan check with building department and um, public works and then going out to a formal bid. Uh, it's the schedule for the project, uh, for the construction of the project, um, it will begin in September of this year, 2015, and will be completed uh, March of 2016. Um, the equipment that we're requesting to be purchased, um, the first item is the observatory dome. This is made by Ash Dome. And we've done quite a bit of research with regard to domes, and this one, is highly regarded in the industry. It, um, there's a number of installations. In fact, a number of ash dome domes have been paired with the telescope that we, we will be purchasing as well. And so it's time tested and both need to work in sync with, with each other. The dome needs to rotate at the same time the telescope, wherever the telescope needs to go, the, the uh, dome needs to rotate as well. So it's important that they work together. Um, this, this dome, uh, received the stamp of approval from Dan McKenna, who is the director of the um, uh, Caltech's observatory. And he's, he's also the gentleman who did the presentation back in September and has been a consultant on this project. Um, we, the size of this dome, we want to make sure that it's, it's large enough that we can actually facilitate a classroom of students who will be uh, who would be taking a look at the at the observatory and actually looking through the telescope as well so that was important um, it fits in our budget and so we're we feel pretty solid with this dome uh, the second second piece of equipment um, is the plan wave oh yeah I think there's a couple other photos of the of the dome there yeah and then one more perfect and the second um, piece of equipment is the telescope itself it's a plane wave CDK 700 um, this is um, this is regarded as a it's a highly high high quality telescope. It's regarded as a research telescope. It is the telescope that Dan McKenna recommended for this project. And um, the the quote that we have from Plane Wave includes a number of items in, in addition, of course, to the telescope and uh, support structure. It also includes cameras, a series of filters, uh, the software that's needed to remote. Uh, control this remotely as well as keep it in sync with the with the dome um, Since the last time we met with the observatory subcommittee, which includes mayor Hobart and uh, council member Townsend uh, the the items uh, Dan McKenna looked at the quote and he uh, Included a couple of upgrades and uh, we feel pretty good about the upgrades He would like to see the material on the glass mirror be upgraded uh, to a more sophisticated material he also requested an additional camera and also an allowance for two computers to be pre-configured with the software. So once, once we receive the package, we're ready to roll with it. Um, that increased the cost by about 20000 which brings, uh, which is uh, stated in the um, staff report, about 275000 which is actually still slightly lower than our initial budget for this particular item. So we're still, still on budget with this. And that, um, that um, brings me to the recommendations. Um, city Council, we're requesting the City Council approve the purchase of the Ash Dome, dome for a little over 118,000 and authorize the City Attorney to, uh, to put together the purchase mm -hmm. agreement. And uh, we're requ requesting the City Council approve the purchase of the Plane, plane Wave Telescope for a little over 275,000 and also um, authorize the City Attorney to, to put together the purchase agreement. So we're, that completes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. Uh, are there any questions of Randy? Hey, I have a question. Uh, Randy, I, I may have missed uh, something in between our original approval and what we're approving today. But didn't we start out with a 
uh, facility that was going to be inside the library. Do we now have a facility that's outside the library? Right. Yeah, they're, they're, um, what you're referring to, I believe, is you have two different directions that we could go. One, either an observatory, which is outside, and that is the direction we're going. <clears throat> and then there's also the notion of a planetarium, which would be inside. And so at this point with this budget, we are, we're moving in the direction of just the observatory. We will still be able to provide live feeds into the library, into the large uh, multimedia me uh, meeting room there. Uh, for large, large events, and we'll be able to actually provide that live feed of exactly what the telescope's viewing at the time. Okay, so does that mean we're going to have two facilities, one inside and one outside? No, it doesn't. No. Can, can I? Sure, please. We're going to, the observatory itself was always going to have to be outside. Right. You can't have a telescope inside, right. clearly. Right. So that was always going to be outside. The inside is the community room that will serve in the form of a uh, planetarium. But the outside facility will be such that children, adults, young adults, old adults, uh, will be able to walk in, look through the scope, see the experience, and that sort of thing. But it's never been any really different than that. Okay, I, I just didn't realize that we were doing both. Uh, looking at the, um, the, going back to the first slide you had there, where it actually showed the dome. Right. Is, is that building going to be similar? Is our building going to be no. similar to this? No, it, no. It, it will be different. This is, just different. A, this is just an example photo uh, from the Ash Dome website. Just this piece right there. And yeah, we, we will have, in addition to, to the dome that's going to house the telescope, we will have a, um, a meeting room, or it's actually an office room. I think we're calling it the cosmic room. Um, and it's where the astronomer can remotely control from his desktop. And, or it can control it right at the, the telescope itself. And so we'll have that. We'll also have a, a, a decking area that will be available for any um, amateur astronomers who want to bring their own telescopes and plug them in and, and be able to view the skies there. Uh, we're also um, going to include a restroom right there on site as well. Okay. Thank you. Let me just explain one quick thing here. Um, the reason why we're bringing these two items separately to you is because of the lead time that's needed to... Um, manufacture these two pieces. We're going to be bringing the actual design of the observatory to the ARB and we'll be showing that to the council here soon. But we had to just advance this just because of the purchasing time. We have to get this material ordered in order to meet our schedule. So regardless of the final design of the building, the dome will fit it yes. regardless. Yes. Okay. Perhaps maybe in the near future when you have a rendering finished, you can bring that and present it, and so everyone can get a real feel of how this dome is going to fit with the library. Absolutely. You it's going to fit very nicely. The, the, the <clears throat> decking area, 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, the dome part of it, the, the area for people to bring their own telescopes and attach to stanchions, and then an area for people to come into the uh, dome. The dome itself isn't going to be a room where people come in and sit down all around and do anything. People are going to be w going through it, looking at the, uh, uh, taking turns looking at through the scope, and then moving on over to the uh, community room. Yes, then the design is very, it goes with the um, library design. It's beautiful. And we will show that to you. It's gorgeous. And when the, ex the exciting thing is, you know, we'll have something that uh, children from all over the valley will be able to use, and no matter how old those children are. Uh, there will be value to anybody that enjoys staring at the stars and thinking yeah. about the past, the future, and all of that. Yeah. Anyway, any other questions of staff? Yeah. Is there any member of the audience who would like to speak to this subject? Seeing none, we'll close the uh, public session. Uh, I'd like to make the motion, if you don't mind. Staff, uh, we, I move that the City Council approve the purchase of the Ash Dome 22 foot 6 inch observatory dome and plane wave CDK 700 telescope for the observatory pro project using successor agency bond proceeds via the ROPS program subject to preparation and approval of the purchase agreements by the city attorney. I'll second that. Moved and seconded by the other member of the committee. Please vote. 
and the motion passes unanimously. I would like to say one, make one final comment about uh, the telescope. The um, head of the Pal Mount Palomar Observatory, who is, which is owned by Caltech, uh, recommended this telescope a long time ago when we first started talking about being uh, the, more than the standard, one that you'll never ever have to explain or ever regret buying, that it is just the cat's meow when it comes to uh, looking into the, uh, uh, into the atmosphere and the future. And uh, so with that, he's also indicated to us that there's a good likelihood that uh, we will be able to associate with Caltech on education programs uh, in our facility uh, for people throughout the valley who are uh, interested in those. And having that relationship with Caltech is uh, a major academic uh, achievement should it come to pass, as we think it will. Dana, does that mean we get to wish upon a star? <laughs> you get to wish upon a star. Very good. Okay. Okay, that is passed. We move now on to the next item on the agenda. Number 11, uh, Bruce, again you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, annually, Riverside County requires a submission of certificates of compliance with Prop 218 for each of our fixed charge districts for which the county administers the collection of taxes, assessments, fees, and charges on behalf of the city. The city has 25 fixed charge districts included including bond improvement assessment districts, which are covered under the county requirement. The list of those districts are below, starting on page 11-1 and 11-2. Staff recommends that the city council authorize city manager or his designee to execute the necessary certificates of compliance. Any questions of staff? Any member of the audience have any questions or like to speak to that issue? Seeing none, we'll close the public session. Can we have a motion, please? I'll make a motion that the city council authorize the city manager or his designee to execute the necessary certificates of compliance and or other documents as may be required for each fixed charge district to be submitted for levying and collection on the fiscal year 2015-16 tax roll. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously, and now we get to lucky item 13. Lucky because it's the last thing on the agenda today. Oh, number 12, Dana. No. Oh. no, your math. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Who's the one that wrote that line for me? I don't like to correct you, but it's <laughs> Lucky 13 is next. Okay, we'll take lucky one. 13 after we take uh, right. semi-lucky number 12. David Bryant, tell us what this is about. Mayor Hobart, members of the library board, we bring before you today a request for, a, uh, for approval for a one-year contract with Baker & Taylor. Uh, that's a major book uh, wholesaler, book and media wholesaler, uh, in the amount of $105,000 for the coming fiscal year. The, um, the reasons for this, it's really a change in vendor for us. We have been using Brodart, well, since the library began in uh, 1996 in what we call the original library building. And we've kept with that vendor for a very long time, but what has happened is <clears throat> they can no longer provide to us, uh, in one case, the array of uh, items that we want to buy promptly, Baker and Taylor being bigger, more critical mass, has a bigger inventory, a bigger warehouse, better reliability of delivery more promptly. We think that helps our, our patrons. And also the um, fact that they will ship to us uh, without any cost. So we really think this vendor is the vendor of the moment for us, and we recommend that the library board uh, approve this contract. Would you explain for us, if you would, uh, David, uh, why the finance committee uh, approved this as a sole source request instead of it going out for an RFP? This is a sole source request, Mr. Mayor, because this uh, company, Baker & Taylor, offers us the complete uh, package that we're looking for, free shipping, uh, big availability of items and uh, short wait time. Uh, they will, um, their, their reliability in our industry is uh, tops. They are really high quality. So we think that sole source, we asked our uh, finance subcommittee to review this and we believe that this is the, uh, the sole source that we, that will do this absolutely the best. It, it makes the most sense. They're the best vendor giving the best uh, product 
in the best time frame. Thank you. Any other questions of the staff? Dana, if I can just sure, uh, mention that uh, the Finance Committee, which was Dana and myself, looked at this, met with the library director, and we feel very comfortable that even though this exceeds the sole source dollar amount, that it, because of the uniqueness of the program, it falls in to something that we can approve. So we do recommend approval on this. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Any other statements or questions from nope. any member of the council? None. Uh, any member of the audience wish to address this subject? Seeing none, we'll close the public session. I, can we have a motion to approve uh, this uh, request? I'd like to move that we award a $105,000 one-year contract for library print and audiovisual materials uh, to book and media wholesaler Baker and Taylor. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to lucky item number 13. We say lucky because it's the last item on the agenda. And this time, I mean it. <laughs> okay, uh, David, you're still at bat. Mayor Hobart, members of the library board, we bring before you this uh, consideration of a donation uh, to the library, pretty special in my opinion, of a rock and mineral specimen collection owned by Joe and Gigi Robertson, who are hoping to make this give to the city through the library, uh, and that it be on display for, the, the provisions of their gift include that it be on display for 20 years beginning September 1, 2015, uh, we think that's a pretty reasonable commitment. Uh, in terms of defining the quality of the collection, it has been sought after by major gemological institutions and museums. Um, it has, uh, I have been to their home a couple of times, as has uh, Councilwoman Smotrich, and I think, I hope she would concur that this is an extraordinary opportunity for us to really get a significant holding which a little bit different than typically a library might covet or, or have, but in our case, and you made reference to this, uh, Mayor Hobart, earlier with the observatory, as far as our educational thrust at the library, we're known for lifelong learning. We think we can build some terrific programming around this. We think we can get geologists in to speak to the collection and of the collection, uh, to talk about those places on the globe where such incredible specimens come from, including as far away as China and certainly Siberia and every place in between. It's just a remarkable um, uh, collection that has been put together by Joe and Gigi over years of travel and a great eye on their, their collective part. Do, do we have any photographs of this that we can you know, show I, to the public? I, regret, I did not give them to Josh, do you have them? Can you? Uh, <clears throat> It would be in the agenda pack. I'm hmm? sorry, I did it's, not. It's uh, in the packet. To the packet. Yeah, but I'd like the public to see it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Grant. Yeah. Okay. Do we have it? Josh will bring the agenda pack, pack it up on, online, and then you'll be able to see some of the photos which were taken in the well, Roberson's uh, home. Is he going to do that now? Or yes. Is, yeah. I mean, it seems that the public should see this. Oh, this no is question. an extraordinary, yes, it is. Uh, an extraordinary exhibit and collection. And uh, uh, it's just amazing that uh, the Robersons want us to have access to it and ha keep it uh, safe and show it uh, prominently. Well, you know, uh, really, in, in uh, the spirit of this afternoon and the extraordinary things we learned that will be built in our, our beautiful city, this is in keeping with that. I mean, this is a world-class collection. The colors alone are just absolutely astonishing that they occur in nature. And again, the educational component for us is, is a breeding ground for great programming. And there's great interest in geology in this valley, as we know. David, can you talk on how it's going to be displayed yet? I'm sorry? Can you talk on how it's going to be displayed yet? It will be displayed in a special customized piece of cabinetry, which is also in this packet of photos. Josh can show you that. And we have an RFP out right now to uh, contractors to see who will uh, give us a quote on constructing this. It's well designed, it uses LED lighting to conserve energy, uh, solar energy I must say, and it is um, 
a beautiful way to display the colors and the size of these specimens is just extraordinary. For those of us who are lay people in geology but interested, I think this collection is something that is just so unusual and so fantastic. It just will work perfectly in our special collections room, which will also house the Gerald and Betty Ford personal library. So we're really, we're going places. To give you an idea of scale, this specimen, uh, amethyst, from Brazil, is probably 16 to 18 inches wide and about 14, 15 inches high. And it's not one of the larger specimens, I must add, but you see the richness of color. Some of them may be sideways. That's a malachite. This is the um, design we have in mind for the uh, display unit. In this case, there's uh, beautiful glass art being shown. So <clears throat> we will have a deep black interior, flat black, uh, well lit overhead. But most importantly, each specimen will have its own LED floodlight on it, spotlight on it. So okay. you'll really be able to show it off. Where would it be located? <coughs> This will be in what is presently the reference room, which will become the special collections room for the library, which will have this display unit on one wall, and on the opposing wall, the uh, special collection of books that we have, some extraordinary collections that have been given to us by private uh, readers in our city, including, again, Gerald and Betty Ford. Yep. Yep. I think this is a tremendous addition to uh, the cultural approach of our library, including the observatory, the library, the programs of the library, this uh, beautiful exhibit. And I think one thing that's really notable is that collections like this are not seen anywhere except in science museums. And then, even in a science museum, you don't get the vast assortment of large pieces, uh, especially on display for a 20-year period of time as a gift. And I'm hoping in the future, as we do our summer reading club, uh, that we can consider using this collection as a means of spurring interest in children uh, in geology and um, going out on trails and, and learning about how these incredible mountains and all the rest that we see here, the natural beauty came to be. So it really, it all, it all uh, dovetails nicely for us in terms of education and just the beauty of this collection. So I thank you so much, David, for making this happen. Well, thank you. Are there you. any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, is there somebody who would like to make the motion that the Rancho Mirage Public Library accept the donation of the privately owned rock and mineral specimen collection offered by Rancho Mirage residents Joseph and Gigi Roberson uh, as set forth in the resolution in our packet? Who wants to make that I'll motion? Make that motion. Okay, moved and seconded, seconded down here. And uh, all those in favor, please vote yes. Those opposed, please be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. David, would you envision other collections like this coming to availability to the library? I think that intimidation is... I think collections like this, Richard, uh, spur other donors. That's what we think. In the world of philanthropy, when somebody sees something as extraordinary as this, and the way we're going to display it, they'll be able to say, that city, that library knows what it's doing. So it could become a model. Okay, uh, that was our last item. We're going to move into closed session as soon as the city attorney tells us why. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The city council is now going to recess into closed session to confer with legal counsel pursuant to government code section 54956.9 regarding the case known as Veronica Juarez versus the city of Rancho Mirage Council and the case uh, known as Brian Harrison versus city of Rancho Mirage. Council will also consider three potential litigation items pursuant to government code section 54956.9D. The meeting stands in recess.